Hello and welcome to the Alexandra Wenman Show. I'm speaking to a very special person today. I've got Dr. Sharon Blackie, the award-winning writer and teacher of mythic imagination and the mythic feminine on the show today. And i um, so excited to have you here, Sharon. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Thanks for the invitation. It's, um, it's wonderful. I think um, I've been doing a series of interviews recently with women that sort of tend to teach and speak on the subject of female elder wisdom. And I think you're the master of this, so I, I can't wait to dive in. Um, I had a bit of a I had a bit of a play with your rooted woman deck this morning. This is lovely. Um, and obviously, interestingly, the first card that I happened to pull is the Kaliach. I hope I've said it correctly you're the only person who i've ever heard say it correctly so well done <laughs> really okay amazing i absolutely love this card and the story of her and i didn't know too much about this mythology before i um i read haggitude well actually i listened to haggitude so i listened to you speaking about haggitude um but one of the things i love about this card and i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you um if you would to talk a little bit about her but I just want to say, and a, and, a, and a shout out to a lot of my clients and viewers, I love the links with the female elder wisdom and the land here because I have a lot of clients and um, students who are female elders in their own right. A lot of them are what we call grid worker light workers who sort of move around the planet working on the earth and, and um, going to sacred sites. And I have a lot of women that are basically doing a lot of work on their own, on themselves, you know, living alone. And a lot of these women own land in various places around the world and are building these beautiful sacred spaces and communities. So I feel like she really fits with um, kind of the theme of, of my work quite a lot. So can you talk to us mm -hmm. about the Kaliach and what she represents and, and what she means to you as well? Yeah, so she is, <clears throat> excuse me, she is um, in our in the Gaelic and Gaelic cultures of Scotland, Ireland, and um, to a lesser extent, the Isle of Man, she is the old woman who creates and shapes the land. So we don't have a creation myth, unfortunately, um, well, at least one hasn't come down to us from our tradition, but we do have this wonderful woman who creates and shapes the land. And there are stories about her in both of those countries, Scotland and Ireland, kind of being there before the flood. So she says, uh, when I was a young lass, the ocean was a forest full of trees. So, you know, just along the geological ages of the earth, she has been there. Stories about her carrying um, an apron full of rocks and stones across, where she walks across the land and she trips up and the stones fall out and they form the hills and the mountains. As well as creating and shaping the land, she's also, particularly in the Scottish stories, a, a guardian and protector of the natural world. So she is the one who will stop, say, a huntsman from taking a pregnant deer in season and says, Donald, don't take any of my hinds if you wait until the time is right, I'll let you have a stag. So she, she has this kind of sense of taking only what you need and only what it's appropriate to take and you know weeping when the forests are cut down so very much associated with the land but the fact that she is this older woman who stands firm in that way who is very very feisty in some of the stories constantly outwitting priests you know who try to uh, who try to kill her uh, just makes her for me such a wonderful role model for older women in the state of the planet as we find it i love it i love the connections as well little impressions sort of coming to me in terms of other kind of older shamanic stories and and the way that women's mythologies have been passed on verbally and through storytelling and like they are like a woven tapestry aren't they I was um I was really recently home in Australia where I grew up but I went to Uluru for the second time in my life and there are areas around that that beautiful rock formation where you can't take photographs or anything because their stories, their ancient stories are actually preserved in the rock and they're so sacred that it, it can only be passed on, obviously, through the, the elder traditions and through verbal um, storytelling and I absolutely love that. And that's um, kind of what she is. She's sort of a, she, she is a lover of rocky places and is very imminent in the land. She kind of is the land, even though she's also this this old woman figure. And what I love about her also is that 
in spite of all of the attempts by Christians to um, sideline her, to make her a silly, wicked old witch, because older women, of course, in that tradition aren't allowed power, or weren't back in the day, allowed power. She has still, all of the stories of her have persisted when so many others have been lost. There are place names, you know, named after the Kaliach. Um, there are rock formations. And it's just lovely that she will not go away. She will not be silenced. So, again, oh, a lovely. great thing for older women. Isn't she so alive in the land? But but how did your own story with these mythologies start? How did you start writing about and getting really interested in the feminine mythologies and wisdom? I, I have been ever since I was a small child, you know, uh, fairy tales and mythology of all kinds. But what was irritating is that I was gr brought up, like we all are, are here, on a, a diet of Greek and Roman mythology, which is all very well. You know, it's very interesting, but it's not from this place. You know, you won't find Aphrodite on top of a very cold, rainy mountain. She's in, you know, olive groves in Greece. And so I really felt a lack, I think, although I couldn't have named it, of women who were powerful in my own tradition. And it wasn't really until I was in my 30s, I would say, late 30s, that I really began to delve into that. I was living in America at the time and feeling very much that it wasn't my place. I had no ancestry there. I didn't know um, any of the kind of energies of the land. Uh, I, I just, and of course, the Native American stuff isn't mine to appropriate. So I really started to delve very deeply into it and found when I came back from America and moved to a croft in highlands of Scotland, found particularly the Kaliach, but also having an, uh, an Irish ancestry too, stories of incredibly powerful otherworldly women. I mean, in, in the Irish tradition, women were the, the moral authority of the other world. They were the ones who came out of the other world to say whatever needed to be said or to change whatever needed to be changed. And Again, you know, we think of them now as kind of silly fairy queens or, um, you know, they've been really trivialized, whereas back in the day they were really very powerful. So that's kind of how it happened in my late in my late 30s. And it was such a revelation to me that there were all of these incredibly powerful old women that we had never been told about, you know, that most people didn't know about. So how could you not write about it? I love it. And I love how, you know, women are really the bridge between the unseen and the seen yeah. worlds, aren't we? You know, it, the mystical traditions all talk about that. So I would love to ask you in terms of, you know, obviously you write a lot about the stories, but have you had any of your own mystical experiences over the years working with these energies and these stories? I think I think if you, if, in the land, yes, I would say so. There, there was a, there was a, of a place when we lived on the Isle of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides, there was a place that nobody used to go to down by the sea. It was very hidden. It was kind of like a carpet of rock with a cliff face behind it. And then there was the headland and, and just it was hard. You happened to had to happen across it. It wasn't on the maps or or whatever. And I, I took to being in this place a lot. And there was a there were stories about the Kaliach, you know, round and about that island. And there was a, a rock there that looked to me like the silhouette of an old woman in that cliff face. And there was also a kind of alcove in the cliff face with a, a sliver, a sliver, it wasn't, it was a slab of Lewisian gneiss, which is very, very old, heavy rock. And it looked for all the world like a bed, you know, um, because it had three sides and then there was this kind of big mattress wedged, wedged right into it. And every now and again, when the light got too much for me in, in the Hebridean summer, uh, towards the end of August, I would go and sleep on it um, so that I could see the stars again, uh, which I hadn't seen for like four months. And I used to call it, jokingly, the Kaliak sped. And I spent a lot of time there thinking about these old stories. And the Kaliak to me was a story of endurance, you know, just over all of those ages. To cut a long story short, we had to leave Lewis. We went to Donegal. Our croft didn't sell. Our house didn't sell for a good 18 months. Then it did sell. So my husband went back to kind of clear out the last few things that we needed. And I said, oh, go go to the, the rocky place and, and just, you know, say hello to the Kaliak bed for me. And he sent me a photograph and that mattress had gone. Absolutely gone. And, you know, it was way up from the water. Water can do many, many wonderful things. But this was an enormous slab of rock. And it just seemed to me, and it, it seemed, you know, I thought it very fanciful at the time, but that whole sense of when we leave a place, we grieve for it. But what if the land grieves for us when we've built a relationship with it? And I really did feel that I'd kind of woken those stories up in the land by walking them, and then I'd gone. And there was nobody else in that place 
to do that. So yeah, land-based things like that, synchronicities, as we might think, really are very much my thing. Wow. Well, okay, so now this is where the guides come in. So they're saying that the mother remembers us, as in the Mother Earth, remembers us as much as we remember her. And there are places where we have walked before as souls mm -hmm. and places that will uh, energetically prepare a bed for you, for your remembrance, mm -hmm. and I guess only until such a time as you no longer need that bed. You know, it's almost like it feels yeah. like you've come full circle. You, you in lying on that bed, received something from the land and she received something from you and then it was no longer needed anymore. And obviously your journey with the land was done at that point and you were ready to move to the next part of that's absolutely yeah. how I see it. it. I really did feel that that she kind of spat me out, that it was <laughs> time to go, because I would have stayed there forever. I thought I was going to stay there forever, but it, it was very bleak and it taught me a lot about endurance and strength, but but I couldn't have written my books there, I don't think. I think it wouldn't have been the right place. And I have very strongly felt all my life, I've moved more than I've ever intended to. I call myself a serial router, but I do root very deeply when I go to places. But every place has taught me a really important lesson that I needed to learn at that time. And I yeah. hope in the place that I've come now, I've kind of circled back to the north of England where I was born. I kind of hope that that's it now, that I don't have any more place-related lessons to learn. But it's fascinating. And it's all been about the stories of the land, not just the actual you know, landscape and ecology. It's all been about the characters who kind of inhabit it. Absolutely. I really feel you. Uh it's interesting because, I, I mean, I'm, I grew up in Australia, but I've been based in London for 25 years. And even though I've I've been based here, I've been moved around the, the planet like a little chess piece and I get the call and I'll dream of a place in the night and I'll be told you're going here. And I'll even, you know, and my, my, my viewers will know, like even when I haven't even had a bean in my bank account, I'll be like, you're going to get me to Easter Island in the middle of nowhere, how? <laughs> and I hand it back and then the next thing I know, things move money comes in the situation changes and I'm guided and I don't know some of the time why I'm meant to be there I just know I'm meant to be there um but it's interesting that I've been plonked here in the UK as well and I feel such an affinity with this land and I'm Scottish um ancestry as well so I really feel an affinity with this land and I keep going am I going back to Australia and it's like not yet not yet not yet but there's something so magical here and I really love how connected you are with it and the way that you write about it it's so beautiful okay I'm pulling another card so the next card which I know very well I'm sure a lot of our viewers will know very well is the crossroads card number 10 um can you speak to us about the crossroads in terms of women and how it impacts us and why the crossroads might come up for women in their lives yeah I mean I think you know I subscribe very deeply to some of the old Greek philosophy, which tells us that each soul um, kind of chooses to come to this place, wherever we are, perhaps even to the particular parents that we were born to, and that each soul comes with a particular gift, a particular, um, a particular thing to be, or sometimes to do. Uh, I always think of it as a particular way of kind of expressing your humanity, in a world. And that concept was taken up by a, um, a post-Jungian psychologist, James Hillman, and he called it calling. And his idea was that the world never gives up on us. You know, we're always trying to find that calling, trying to express that gift, but we come to choice points. And sometimes we take a path that is not aligned with our calling, but the world is always offering us choice points so that we get to make that choice again. And eventually, you know, we get it. That's kind of the life journey. And so I see crossroads in that kind of way. When you come to a crossroads, unless you're going to stand there or turn back, you have to make a choice. You know, there are three potential paths. And so you're forced to make a choice whether you're inclined to or not. Otherwise, you go back. But of course, we can't go back in life's journey. So it really is that I always think of it as a very beautiful thing because it is that sense of the world kind of presenting us with a way to, to be true to ourselves, to follow the path that ena enables us to be true to ourselves. So it's that. It's it's kind of a forced choice, but it's not a forced choice in a negative way. But it requires a lot of evaluation. It requires a lot of instinct as well, I think, a kind of gut sense of which 
direction we should go. And for all the times that we get it, what we think of as wrong, I don't actually see it as wrong. I see a lot of those choices that are kind of not aligned with our path as as learning experiences, necessary learning experiences, so that when we do pick up the path, we've got all this stuff that we've we've kind of covered. It can be quite painful too, can't it, being at a crossroads? And it, if you don't really know, I'm just speaking from experience here, like I've sat in a crossroads on a personal level for a couple of years and I'm, I'm only just coming through it now, but for a long time it wasn't clear which was the right direction. So I had to just sit in the unknown for a really long time and just trust that like my higher self or the the universe or uh, that the path would open. And there was just this question mark over the top of it for so long, but it was almost like that in itself was the journey. It was, it was, you know, it's always the journey inwards. I don't know if I could do any more journeying inwards, to be honest, but it was almost like I came to a place of, if I don't know which way I'm going to go, then I'm just going to sit here in the stillness and allow it to unfold. And until I know the answer, then I I reserve the right to not know. And I think in our day-to-day lives, we're so used to pushing and grafting and, and doing the masculine of go, go, go and, and going where we think we should go or living according to somebody else's rules or somebody else's belief systems mm. and not really sitting. We've not be, we've been so conditioned to not sit with ourselves and to not ask ourselves what really do I want or desire or what really is my higher self's wants or desires mm. for me. And I think mm. unraveling from all that conditioning, that that for me was a painful process and, and it felt really like almost like a personality flip, like I wasn't who I, I thought I was. And a new me was emerging or, or being birthed. Yeah, you... sure. And I think that's exactly particularly what happens to women in menopause. And yes, you know, for a culture that tells us we must keep going, you've come to a crossroads, you've got to go, you've got to go somewhere, must make a choice now. And you're quite right that often the way, the best way to approach that is just to sit until something gives or something becomes more obvious. Um, and we do that in menopause, I think, you know, menopause, and I wrote about this in Haggitude, menopause should be a time between stories, the kind of the old story of the first half of our life, which for most of us is outward focused. It's about building a persona, building a profession, building a family, uh, you know, all of the kind of contraptions of the outer life. But then we're required in the second half of life to take an inner journey. And you can't just switch from one to the other. And, you know, this switch is trying to take place while our body is kind of falling to pieces and everything that we thought wants to find us is being stripped away. And to me, the only way to deal with menopause um, and to experience menopause in all of its fullness, because it can be a very, well, it is a very transformative period, has to be done in the dark. But we can't tolerate uncertainty. We've been taught that that means we've failed. If we can't make a choice, we've failed. And that whole sense of just sitting with the uncertainty and letting something be born out of a kind of more natural process, I think is very beautiful. And we don't we don't do it enough. We don't do it enough. And there's the next card, the rooted card just pops <laughs> up. And I mean, this is just everything, isn't it? It's like staying rooted deeply within yourself, your own psyche, your own knowing, your own sense of place, I suppose. Place you- particularly. It, it is very much about a sense of rootedness in the wider world around us, not just ourselves. That's the journey in those cards, really. I love that. I mean, you wrote a lot about um, your own journey in Haggitude. Um, can we talk a little bit about being rooted in the sense of kind of coming into our bodies and listening to our bodies, because obviously as we age, our bodies go through so many changes Um, and you've been through your own challenges with illness and everything with this. Would you say that these bodily changes are a little bit like an initiation of sorts? Sure, I think so. I mean, you know, we're talking about, uh, so for a start, menopause is a huge initiation. It's what it is meant to be. And so this whole cultural discourse now that we have to keep holding on to everything, you know, we have to keep holding on to youth and do all of the things that we had to do before. And that's just nonsense. It is supposed to change. And our body is telling us that we are changing and we're trying just to ignore it like we're not embodied people. You know, it's insane. That physical incarnation is what we're here for. It's who we are. And if we don't listen to our bodies, then it's been wasted. And I can say that because I would say for the first 40 years of my life, I didn't. 
Um, but then it became it became very obvious to me, and it was part of a relationship with place. You know, you're an animal in a in a place, um, as well as 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 um, as all of the other dimensions that we bring in our relationships. And for me, menopause was about that. But also, um, a few months into the pandemic, I developed a fairly aggressive form of lymphoma, kind of out of the blue, and um, that. I mean, boy, you know, you don't get any more of a physical initiation than that. And that whole sense of death being very pos- possible and very imminent if, if um, the treatment hadn't taken place was a huge revelation to me because we we know intellectually about death. You know, we know that we're going to die, but until you actually face it and not by accident, but by, you know, if if it doesn't go well in four months, you might be dead. That's a really kind of it's not just about planning and you know what you do, what you take care of. It's just that whole sudden appreciation of your body and of you as an embodied creature that that might not be there for very much longer. And I think, again, we don't we don't talk about death and illness in these forms, but from my perspective, they're also big teachers. You know that whole sense of illness, and and I know you have to be careful with this because if you try to take meaning in illness and you try to look at what might have caused it uh, and what have you, there is that sense of you know you're blaming yourself for your illness, and it isn't about that at all. But I think there is not only a reckoning but also an opportunity. Mm. It's it's the biggest shakeup that you ever get, and it, all of the trivia just fades away and you become very, very focused on what actually matters to you. You know, I think, and that's true for people that have survived the same kind of lymphoma that I have had for years, for decades. It doesn't matter how long it is. You know that any day now, you know, this could be taken away from you and in a very real and visceral kind of way. So that that embodied sense, and it also gives you a great appreciation of your body, as I think does growing older. You know, you look at all of the things that that you have gone through, um, it's it is a remarkable thing, and I, I wish we were a more embodied culture. I really do, rather than just staying in our heads all the time. And that's the psychologist saying that, so <laughs> it's a bit weird. I think we're relearning it, aren't we, Sharon? I love how you speak about that. I have um, so obviously, I I part of my work is working as a channel, but I don't just channel spirits and angels and things like that. And and I always talk about channeling not just as a party trick but as an incredible gift because if you can learn to you know connect to consciousness outside of the 3d or physical realms then you can actually learn a lot one of the things i teach in my channeling course is how to talk to your own body is how to speak to what's going on in your body so talk to an illness and when i speak to uh clients who have things like cancer or different illnesses what we do is we talk to the illness and we ask it what it's here to teach. And nine times out of 10, that illness will say along the lines of, I'm teaching you how to live and how to live fully. The only time the illness isn't teaching how to live is when it's the doorway to the beyond and it, and it is leading to death. And in that case, it is a, a, a transition and a birth. So I, I completely agree with you. I think we can learn so much from it. It is I think a, a kind of an initiation, and I know that in times of old, one of the initiations they used to go through deliberately was to stare death in the face. In ancient Egypt, you know, they'd face their fears, they'd seal themselves in the sarcophagus, and they would go on the, the journey through the mm-hmm. underworld. I think death as a consciousness, in its own right, is is like an old friend. You know, oh, that, that is a, a you know a, a beautiful spirit that actually comes to guide us through the birth to the other side. So, I love that. It is. Is there anything that you would like to say to anybody out there who's facing illness and going through this process as well at the moment, in terms of kind of your wisdom that might help them? So I think everybody has to deal with, with this in their own way, according to their own lives. But the one thing that I learned, which which can't go away, is kind of related to what you're just saying. You you have to befriend death, mm-hmm. and you know we we are taught, and and perhaps rightly so, because we love life, that death is a bad thing uh, and to be avoided as long as possible. But we don't get the choice most of the time. Sometimes we do, but most of the time we don't get the choice. And so, I think that. Um, I did have a very strong sense of a kind of archetypal death, if you like, um, walking with me, kind of having come into my life unwanted, but nevertheless there. And so you have to learn 
to befriend that. I had a very strong sense of, of you know, some kind of death-like energy walking with me. And I think it will always be there. And that's a good thing because then you develop a relationship with death so that when the time comes, it's not something um, to be dreaded. Uh, and and it teach it does. You're quite right. Teach you to see death as as a very beautiful energy and a very necessary energy in order for new things to arise and in order for you to move on to whatever is waiting for is whatever that might be. So that was a real big learning for me. And you know, in my work, um, I do often ask people how how they picture death almost. And a lot of people don't have a particular picture image, like visual image of death. Um, for some people, it's good if they do, if they're very visual. But it, but I think you can create a real sense of of that beauty of it, um, and a piece of it, and the and the adventure of it actually as well. That it's, it seems to me to be a very um, a very alive <laughs> energy. Um, well, we all go through it at some point, don't we? Oh. I mean, it's the one thing we cannot avoid, right. you know, on this earth plane. We can't avoid birth and we can't avoid death. The two sure. doorways. <laughs> and, and another thing, like menopause back in the day, another thing that the culture deals with very, very badly because we don't have these conversations about what death is um, and, and how it might, how one day we might be glad to go with it, you know. Are there any... Um really prominent kind of mythological stories around this, especially in terms of our Celtic heritage that that speak to death. I mean, I know that the ancients, they obviously had ancient cans and things like that, and they, they had a lot of ceremony around it. Is there anything that that you feel kind of speaks to this? In no, no, to be honest, not not in this tradition. That There is not. The, the best stories about death, not surprisingly, perhaps, come from Siberia. Um, and uh, for my next book, which is called Wise Women, it's out in October, and that will be kind of a collection of stories of older women, all of the ones that I couldn't squeeze into Haggitude. There, um, there are a number of, story, of Siberian stories, and, and one in particular, which is a story that I love, um, about uh, so a, a warrior dies twice, and an old man comes along, and kind of clearly a shaman comes along and brings him back to life. When he dies the third time, the old man says, I can't save you, so he picks up the bones, um, of this warrior and he takes them to an old woman in the underworld and this old woman is sitting by a fire underground surrounded by clearly skeleton uh, creatures and um, she burns the bones and sleeps on the ashes of the bones and then the warrior is brought back to life so you know that that's one of the few actual stories where this happens but every every great mother goddess in European mythology was a goddess of death as well as life you know um you don't ever see one without the other so in the irish tradition the great goddesses the morrigan for example who was the kind of great crow goddess is very much a goddess of life and she was the next death. one i was going to um, talk to you about so i yeah. love that she's come up yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i i really i often see this you know when i work with spirit they talk about death is a birth and birth is a death and in my own story, I died at birth and then was resuscitated. So my birth, birth death has been very close to me my whole life. And I know that viewed from spirit, death is a birth into the other realms as well. And it comes with a lot of celebration. And I've often spoken in my courses and workshops about how in the Eastern philosophies, they talk a lot about death and there's a lot more kind of wisdom around it. One of the things I do love in the Irish tradition, though, is the concept of the celebration of the person's life and the wake and, you know, like having a big shindig and a hoedown and, you know, making sure that you give them a good send off. And, you know, there is a celebration element. There, to there is. And, and it's throughout. It's not just the, the the stories, but also the songs. I mean, there is a wonderful old um, <laughs> old Irish song, um, which is basically called Isn't It Grand Boys to Be Bloody Well Dead? And it's, you know, it's in the church and look at the mourners, bloody great hypocrites. And it I played that at my mother's funeral wow. actually, uh, because uh, well, I couldn't be there because it was the pandemic and I didn't have an immune system. But but that was the music for her funeral because that was, you know, the music that she loved. And it, would, it just made everybody laugh. You know, you could see on the video screen I was able to be there by, by video. Just that whole sense of, of course, there's grief. There has to be grief. But if there's only grief, you know, it's not healthy. And so, yeah, the Irish have a great a great bunch of traditions around around that just to break to break through that you know that desperately dark emotion. The Irish know how to party. I love it. Good sure. crack. Good crack. <laughs> <laughs> Good crack. Um, oh, just before I move on to the next card, something's popping in around men. <laughs> so I'd love to talk about 
obviously as women are rising again into our power, we're seeing huge movements across the planet, not just movements in terms of women kind of fighting for their rights and, you know, stepping up and going, hey, what about me? But there's also a lot of kind of silent movement going on I'm seeing behind the scenes. And, you know, I, I, I follow Pam Gregory's astrology and I've interviewed her and I've seen a lot of the astrology is kind of supporting this great awakening and resurgence of women's wisdom and things like that. But what do you think it means for men and they're going through their own transformation as we kind of move away from these structured patriarchal kind of um, ways of being into a more fluid feminine way of being? How do you feel uh, um, men are changing in relation mm. to this? Well, all of my work has been about women's um, stories because I, I, I feel very strongly that I have to do, I really have to write from my own lived experience. And that's why I only deal with European myth and folklore, because it's kind of where my feet are planted and it feels like mine and I understand it. So I've always been very reluctant to kind of engage in this whole concept, uh, the whole idea of, of what men's stories are, except interesting that you should ask that because last weekend on my Substack, The Art of Enchantment, where we talk a, you know, a lot about women's stories, I did put um, a post up there called, So What About the Men? Because somebody had asked me that <laughs> when I was giving a talk at the Oxford Literary Festival the week before. And it's interesting what comes out of that. I do have male readers, um, oddly, perhaps. But there was a great sense that that kind of women have left men behind in a sense. And I'm talking about men here who recognize the problem, who are not part of the patriarchy, but when men who see it, but and and kind of almost feel um envious of what women are doing. Not women's position in the world, because we still have a lot of work to do there, but just that whole sense of redefinition and, and redefining. And one of the things that I have written about, and I think this is important both for men and for women, is really an antidote to the hero's journey. So Joseph Campbell, American mythologist's idea, you know, that every story um, in, in, uh, in all mythical traditions in the world is basically a hero story. It's very linear. It's all about overcoming and winning and slaying dragons and, you know, very very um, active and outward oriented. Not always. Campbell did put a bit of inner work in there. Um, and, and really, I've talked about the, the post-heroic journey because I think most men don't see themselves as heroes. Most of the men that I talk to, they don't want to be the great and the good. You know, they don't want to be the one who solves all the world's problems. They want to be the smith or the magician or, or the warrior. You know, they want to be something different. And um, that does resonate, I think, with a lot of men. Um, that whole idea of, okay, what, what else is there to be? We don't need to be heroes. We need to move out of a heroic age. And I think there are lots of men thinking about that now and, you know, wondering about their own archetypes and their own stories. And what's very interesting, just as an aside, is if you look at the world of kind of fairy tale scholarship, you know, looking at looking at fairy tales to, to kind of for, for their wisdom, there's a, there's a feminist approach to that that has been going on for decades volumes of academic papers and non-academic papers and books, women everywhere looking for themselves in fairy tales. There's virtually none by men. And I think part of that is because, you know, we have had this whole, whole idea that, well, men are the default, you know, we don't need to write about ourselves because we just are. But that's beginning to change now. And people are looking for, men are looking for themselves in stories and ways that isn't just heroic. So I think it's a really interesting time of many, many different shifts. I love that. There's a, there's, a, there's a that really lovely book by Robert Bly, uh, Iron John, I think it's called. Mm. Yeah, Iron John's yeah. a good one. That set off the myth of poetic men's movement and really made a, you know, again, changed a lot of people's ways of thinking about uh, about what it is to be a man today. Yeah, and that thought of, you know, that whole thing of cutting the apron strings when you're a young man and being taken off and learning the men's work. I think there's such a resurgence of that now. It's wonderful. I was going to ask you as well, one of my questions that I'd actually written down was, what do you think the fundamental difference is between the hero's journey and the heroine's journey? Because I think there's there's obviously yeah. indeed, and and the rooted woman oracle is very much a, a kind of heroine's journey approach. I think you know, Campbell lived a long time. Joseph Campbell, who um, founded um, or delineated the hero's journey, lived a long time, and over his life, it has to be said, as he particularly got as he got older, he changed his mind about some things because that's how you grow. And so his his original kind of you know very linear, um, very active, saving the world energy of, of the hero's journey. I think he he eventually began to accept that perhaps the heroine's journey, if there was one it wasn't for him to write, might be a little bit different. And I think to me, it is very much more a much more inward 
focus journey. It's a cyclical journey. I don't see it as very linear with a beginning and a middle and the end. And I think it is very much about, about the kinds of what we think of as feminine qualities, whether they appear in men or in women, um, you know, creativity, intuition, um, empathy. I think it is more about community, whereas the hero's journey, most heroes are very solitary. You know, they do it by themselves. In stories where there are women, they always do it in community, whether that community is human or, you know, a bunch of mice who will help you sort the seeds if you give them some of your porridge. Um, so it, it's just, I think it just has a different, it, it embraces those feminine qualities that we haven't quite as a culture learned to to appreciate. Different ways of knowing. There's the rational and the intellectual way of knowing, and that's really important unless it's the only way that we value. And I think we there are many ways of knowing, as you know, and we have to be able to know the right circumstances into in you know in which to to adopt a particular way of knowing. And so to me the heroine's journey is about bringing back those qualities that we just don't value anymore. We're sort of reweaving our own tapestry, aren't we? And it, it's like a bit like feeling your way in the dark. I, I realized that the unknown is such a huge component of this. And I've had I've personally had to get very, very comfortable in the unknown. Um, and I think a lot of us are are paving the way as pioneers in terms of this. I think we're going into really unknown territory as a humanity at the moment. I mean, with the, with the end of those Mayan calendars and everything, and we're in this whole new world energy. Um, it's getting really comfortable, and this is why I love the the Black Madonna and the Dark Mother kind of archetypes because they're sitting in the dark and reclaiming that womb space and realizing that the dark doesn't need to be terrifying it can actually be a bit of a a, a colder and a blank canvas of recreation again and sure. again and we we have to reclaim the dark because i do think you know and again perhaps it's the i think in the west a lot of it is probably the influence of christianity that that only the light is valuable and that anything dark is evil and must be put behind us and the old stories tell us that's not true the old stories tell us that you don't have light if you don't have dark i mean you know what is light it's only in relation to the dark and vice versa and those qualities of the dark um which can be very uncomfortable to deal with if we look at them in terms of our own life you know the, but but the the dark feminine is very very potent power it is about creativity it's about the the pain of birth it's about rage when rage is actually a good response to something you know kind of controlled um focused rage and yeah i th i think we need to spend more time really looking at the dark and how we can integrate it because otherwise it's something that we push to one side and those things always come out and bite us if we try to do that oh my god they come out don't they they come it's like they overflow out of our wounds when we least expect them and you know i think that's part of that's the beautiful part i think of the menopause especially you know we talk about the furies you know and suddenly it's almost like i know for me personally i feel like i went from being the maiden to the crone I haven't done the mother bit in the middle mm. and it came as a huge shock it was like oh holy cow how did I get to this age how is this happening to me what's going on with my body but all of a sudden it was like the Morrigan came in and I had a visit from the Morrigan in the goddess temple in Glastonbury and she was basically like you're stepping through a veil and all of a sudden it was like I I'd done a lot of work on myself but it was like I woke up to another level of where I have been tolerating bad behaviour and others. And from a psychological point of view, we look at people pleasing and fawning and that had been kind of a default setting for a long time. And and how embodied that was and how um, no matter how much you try and change the program, it's so part of the conditioning and I think it's been part of the collective feminine conditioning for such a long time yeah. that when I woke up from it, it was literally like a veil ripped. I heard it audibly go... <laughs> and get taken off me and then suddenly I was looking around at my life going have I married the wrong man am I living in the wrong place like everything literally overnight changed and I think almost the shock of that I, I, no stranger to a dark night of the soul but the shock of that was more like I turned and really faced myself and went what have you been doing to yourself mm -hmm. it wasn't about what anyone else was doing there was like this no need to put blame anywhere else, but it was, whoa, I woke up to me and how I'd been living on a really, really deep embodied core level. And that brought up a lot of anger and rage within me. And it was just embodied. It, it was so beyond something logical. It was like my body was kind of purging out all this stuff. And a few things had happened 
you know, in personal life to trigger it. And one was a really painful experience and one was a really beautiful experience and these equal parts came together. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting in our perceptions of, I think, feminine rage and the fact that it has been so suppressed. You know, if you're a woman who expresses anger in a healthy way, we've, we've, we've not even been allowed to do that, have we? We talk about how men haven't been allowed to cry, women haven't been allowed to get angry, and there's a whole reframing going on around this. But the next card, obviously, on this topic is so on point. Now, I, I can't pronounce it this way, but I'm assuming this is to do with the banshee. Is this right? Yeah. 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 So can you talk to us about this archetype and the Keening woman as we... Uh, that's kind of really going back to death again. I mean, the, the only thing that we do have in the Irish tradition um, and the wider British traditions, as far as I can tell, around death is a lot of harbingers of death. So a lot of a lot of um, old women in the stories who kind of wail when somebody is going to die, if it's kind of a family that they're associated with. We have the Banshee in Ireland, in um, Gaelic Scotland, we have the Ban Nee, which is the washerwoman at the Ford who washes the blood-stained clothes of warriors who are going to die. And there is this sense that older women are kind of not only announcing death, but kind of midwifing it in a sense. And in the Irish tradition, um, uh, we pretty much died out uh, but there's a bit of a resurgence, is this practice which happened at wakes in Irish-speaking areas of keening. And the keening woman, the bankincha, was it was kind of a spontaneous eruption of song without words, mostly noise. And it wasn't just about expressing grief. It wasn't keening to express grief. It was almost as if that song was kind of carrying the soul to the other world in some of those old traditions, uh, you know, kind of on the wave of song. So we do, when I said earlier, we don't have any stories of, of death. We don't have any stories, but we have characters that of old women that are somehow associated with it. And that that's always a really interesting thing to me, that, that sense that, again, it's an older woman. Of course, older women were often midwives back in the day. And Midwiving, de midwiving death, why not? Oh, my God. So much of what you're saying from the mythologies is triggering things that I've known in, in my own work but haven't had a label for it. Mm -hmm. And I know that the womb is a birth-death door, so it's, it's both that way and that way. And I do a lot of soul midwifery work where I help souls pass to the highest place for them. But I... Something I, I want to share along the lines of this and this keening, this song being the doorway into the beyond. Um, one from a more academic perspective, because there's a, a, a wonderful man called Dr. Raymond Moody who talks about near-death experiences. And he's done a lot of research on the language of nonsense and how people, when they're approaching death, may start to speak gibberish. Um, mm -hmm. I call that light language or angelic language. Um, and I actually use that. That has been shown to me through channeling how to open to the quantum realm and, and move energy. But I had an experience in 2017 where I was on a Mary Magdalene pilgrimage to Rennes-le-Chateau in the south of France. And this was a, a shocking experience for me because I didn't know what was going on with my body. But it, I, le I learned on the job, basically. <laughs> but I was with a group of 12 women, 12 people. They weren't all women, but they were mostly women. And we were sitting on a wall near uh, Saunier's uh, home. It was a car park with a wall looking over a valley. And we were just sitting. It was a sunny day and we were thinking about what we're going to do next and we were all chilling out. And some people started just gently singing or humming. And I thought, and I was filming people and I thought, I want to sing. I want to sit down and sing. And I sat on the wall and I just started humming. And all of a sudden, this the light language started going and my body started moving and this beautiful chant came through me and it, it I feel like it came from the consciousness of the Magdalene, but I'm not 100% sure, but it could have just come from the earth. And it was this song, almost like a memory of a song I'd known in a previous lifetime. And it was the words were, Oh, holy mother, oh, holy child, return to the mother, oh, holy child. And it went through, oh, holy father. Da, da, da. And it was this beautiful song. And all of a sudden, in the singing of it, my whole energy field opened up and all these souls started pouring out through my body and my body was shaking and I had twelve, the, 12, the other 11 people around me having to hold my body 
as this spirit release uh, experience was going on. And these people that I saw what had happened to them and they had been massacred. I saw caves under the earth where they practiced their work and that most of them were women and children. And so as they were coming through, I was kind of feeling their emotions and playing out their experience, crying and sobbing. My body was shaking and I could see what they were seeing as they came up through my body. It was like I was, and they were all like looking around, terrified, looking for the threat. And then we were moving them on. So that's the first time I've ever experienced like that being given mm -hmm. a label or a term. And other times where I've experienced just spontaneous kind of singing and, and, and speaking in tongues or whatever you would call it without trying to do anything is in Glastonbury in the, the white spring. But in that case, it was more of a, it, the energy was just beautiful. I just wanted to sing because of the acoustics, but the energy was so beautiful that that felt more of a, um, like a reconnection to something divine, more of a bringing down of something than a, than a letting go of something. But that to me is incredible. I think that as women, the voice, well, I think as people, the voice is so incredibly powerful and, you know, learning to be classically trained as a singer, but also using the voice in healing, the voice really is our soul signature and it connects us to everything. As we know, in the beginning was the word. So is there is there something around um, our women's voices here or anything else that you want to speak to around this along those lines? I know that a lot of the work that I do is so out there and, and quite mystical and, you know, so it's lovely to put it into a, a container in a way. Mm, I th really, uh, not, not as far as I am aware of. I, I really just know that character and, and, and the uh, the folklore around her, but I can't think of anything that really kind of necessarily relates to that. What would you say to women who have felt like they haven't found their voice or don't know what their their particular truth is? Is there any kind of guidance or advice that you... Could... I don't really think of it personally in terms of finding your truth. That, so that's not language that I would use. That's not to say that it's the wrong language. But again, I would put it back into that language of calling and finding your truth I, I don't know. I literally, I don't know what that means, but but I would relate it to that whole sense of finding, I guess, the truth of who you are, perhaps, um, which comes back to this idea that every soul comes to this world to express a particularly unique way of being human. Every one of us has a, a particular gift. And Hillman talked about, well, Plato talked about it as a kind of daemon that comes with us, a kind of, uh, people have called it a kind of guardian angel. Um, Hillman, who was not necessarily into angels, called it a kind of image that we come with us, that we bring with us into this world. And I see life and the journey through life very much as a process of aligning with that image. You know, so that uh, the old Platonic story is hilarious. It's basically, you know, the soul decides with the help of um, the goddess Ananke, who is the mother of the fates, the three fates in Greek mythology, what it is that they will do, stroke be, um, in the in the physical life. But then before they are born, they drink the waters of the river Leaf, the river of forgetfulness. So they land in this life, not having a clue what it was. But that is the whole point. That is the whole point to see if you can in the physical world, realign with that kind of idea of your own particular unique gift, what it is, even if it's just the ability, just, just is the wrong word, even if it's the ability to to create a beautiful garden, to make people around you smile. You know, we're talking about little things here, not huge world shattering things. And so I think of it very much like that. And I always encourage people that I work with to to look for that, to look for clues as to what that might be. And a lot of it is things that we loved in childhood, you know, mm -hmm. even sometimes the stories that we loved, the characters that stay with us and will not go away, the things that we loved before we were told that it was a thing to love that, you know, the things that kind of spontaneously we loved. So there are many, many clues about that, I think. And it really is, I think, particularly as you get older, worth interrogating that. What are the clues? What did I love as a child? What can I not abide? What stories do I love? Who are the archetypal women that really are speaking to me? You know, all of these things I think are clues about that that sense of our authentic, real self. I think our calling changes too, doesn't it? I know I, I would call it like soul purpose or sacred purpose, I suppose. 
Um, but I've had experience of like following that calling and then at a certain point the timeline kind of shifting and a new calling coming in. And I think that sometimes um, what I used to almost resist the calling because there was this part of the subconscious going, well, if I achieve it, then what's left to achieve? You know? Ah, well, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, because I, that's not the way that I'm talking about calling. You right. know, so it's not it's not vocation even. It's not what no. you do in the world. It's very much about... Ah, it's really hard to describe. If if you if you were to think about somebody that you loved, and try in a in a few words or or an image, to say who that person is, what are they? What are they in the world? You know, are they a healer, um, for example? Well, what is it that kind of defines them? No matter what they do in the world, no matter what their job is, no matter you know, no matter where they are, what is the essence? I suppose of that person, and really. Calling in that idea is something that is a life's journey. So you never kind of achieve it. You're always expressing it. Mm-hmm. And then when you've expressed it in one particular way, as you get older, maybe there's another way to express it and to constantly deepen that. And I think it's really very important as we get older um, that we kind of that we we kind of focus on that because menopause strips away everything that we once thought defines us, mm-hmm. you know. All of the physical stuff, all of the outward focus stuff, it's just, it's gone, you know? It's really hard. striving to get somewhere or achieve. Absolutely, something. absolutely. Yeah. And what is left? I think of I think of menopause as an alchemical process, and I wrote about that in Haggitude. When, when it's burned away, what's the essence of what's left mm. in you? And all of the trappings, all of the beauty, perhaps, or, or anything that really mattered to you, if that is gone... What's left? What, what are you? Who are you? And that's kind of call, what I mean by calling in that in that old sense. So, who are you as an essence? And yeah, what's the essence of you? Yeah, yeah. What? And I love that. The next card I pulled is the sacred marriage. So that's really kind of speaks to that in a way. Is it? Is there? Because um, I see this it, it not just as about um, men, men and women in the outer union, but as the union of our kind of inner masculine and feminine. Is this? Um, what you what you see this as both really i mean i think yes i mean certainly uh, as as a jungian uh, you know young family believed that, that we we all have feminine and, and masculine qualities the anima and the animus as he put it but it's not just about kind of reconciling those different ways of being in the world those different ways of knowing those different qualities in ourselves i think it's also literally about men and women finding a way to be different in the world and yet still make it happen rather than being adversaries as I think we have been for for too many centuries so it's it's a little bit of both coming into the unity love consciousness isn't it um and my final I think I'm just going to pull one more card and we can talk about this one well actually there's two together and we've got pilgrimage Mm -hmm. and shape-shifting Okay, so pilgrimage, really what I was trying to do with that card deck was say there are lots of ways to conceive of your life's journey. You know, some of us are on a quest, you know, we're directed to find a specific thing. Some of us are on um, on a boat, uh, the old Irish story called the Imram, which is basically, we used to be a Christian story where monks would literally get in a coracle and put themselves out to sea and then just wait to see where they ended up. And they believed that it was God kind of guiding them to a particular place. So very undirected. And the pilgrimage is a little bit of both. So it's an actively spiritual journey. And most people kind of know, you know, what path they're going to follow, but it is very much inward looking. It's it's a search for meaning. Almost always a pilgrimage is very much a search for meaning, however it takes place. And the shape-shifting card, in our folklore, and in our mythology, women are constantly shape-shifting. And you get in, again, let's look at the, the Marian, for example. She's as much crow as she is human, and one form isn't superior. It's just kind of, it's it's just, she's a crow and she's a human. And that whole sense of women in our fairy tales shape-shift kind of naturally. You know, it's part of who they are. So we have the selkie story, which is kind of part woman, part seal. We have swan women who are swans sometimes and humans the other times. And this is natural and a gift. When men shapeshift in fairy tales, it's always because they've been cursed and they have to be disenchanted. (laughs) So that whole sense of women's um, connection to the natural world, to the animal world, perhaps because of, you know, the kind of bodies that we've got, I think shines through very, very strongly in our folklore. And I think that's something really to embrace, not to be too 
Anne. Not to be too hung up on a particular form, a particular appearance, not to be too rigid, I suppose, in who we think we are, but to allow allow the shape shiftings to happen when they need to. I love it, the unfolding. Wonderful. Oh, Sharon, it's been so lovely talking to you. Just on a parting note, can you talk to us a little bit about your next book? Because I know that you you said that you were met, you were creating this next book of all the the kind of characters that you couldn't fit in Hagatude. And for those of you watching, Hagatude's a brilliant book. I absolutely love it. And I think it was so needed when you brought it out. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Hagatude really was was what I was trying to do in Hagatude was look at the kinds of older women that there are in European myth and folklore and to talk a lot about how that maps onto our lives today. But, you know, it wasn't a book where I was going to tell the whole story of some of these women, because it wasn't a story book. It was it's a book about the psychology of the second half of life, really, and the mythology of the second half of life. But as I kept reading, and this I've been doing this for five years now, I've done a really big research project of European myth and, and folklore, volumes of old books <laughs> all around this this um this study that that I literally have been leafing through, looking for old women. And there were so many of them. And so it required a book to bring them all together. And I think we have something like, I think 35 or so different old women stories and they're all different you know their, their way of embracing the second half of life is different they're very diverse characters and so they are being brought together some wonderful old women in there um very funny very feisty with a, a kind of psychological commentary about what these particular stories might reflect in our lives as we grow older so i'm really looking forward to that coming out because i just love some of these stories I love that. It makes me wish my grandmothers were still alive. It would have been a great gift for them that, you know, I think we have to honour our, our own mothers and grandmothers, don't we, and those that sure. have gone before us as well. Well, I can't wait to read the next one. Thank you so much, Sharon. That's wonderful. And for those of you watching, I'm going to pop the links to Sharon's website. I think it's SharonBlackie.net. Is that right? Yes, it is. Yeah. SharonBlackie.net. So if you want to hear more about Sharon, please follow her on Substack as well. Substack is a wonderful platform. I've just joined it, though. Um, it's a wonderful platform. So please follow Sharon. It's The Art of Enchantment. It's The Art of Enchantment, yeah wonderful so we'll pop the links to everything below so that you can follow her work if you don't already and the wealth of wisdom and knowledge coming through this woman is incredible and and I want to honor how much research you do I think this is incredible I know that researching books and and finding all the information within and without is a is a big old job so thank you so so much for bringing it together in such beautiful collections oh thank you it's been a real pleasure talking to you you too, Sharon. Thank you so much.